I'm honored to uh, be back with my West Coast uh, Saddleback family. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to welcome all of your campuses. You know, you got campuses in Manila, uh, Manila Jupiter. Um, <laughs> here you're going to plant one in, in Mars soon. Not over, not just in the world, but in the, in, in, in the solar system. So, uh, but welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm so glad to, uh, to be back with, with you guys. Um, you have trapped all of the perfect weather here. <laughs> so I'm glad to be able to experience that. Hey, let me pray and we're going to dive right into it. Uh, Father, in the name of Jesus, that name that is above all name, the name that gives life, that even now that when your name is mentioned, hearts are being broken and remade by your grace. And through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, you, Prince of Peace, would you soak us, saturate us, marinate us in your peace so that we can be peacemakers. Our country, our world desperately needs peace. And so, Prince of Peace, Lord Jesus, through your spirit for the Father's glory, would you infuse us with your peacemaking grace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So a couple years ago at Transformation Church, we're, we're a, a five-year-old church, so we're, we're a baby church, and so a couple of years ago, literally a couple of years ago, I'm preaching, and at the end of the service, um, I noticed this white guy running down the aisles. And so after service, I like to give people fist bumps, chest bumps, hugs and stuff, and as I'm doing that, I'm noticing this white man running down the aisles. And as he gets closer, I notice snot hanging from his nose. So two things go through my mind. First one is this. What would Jesus do? I think he would do a miracle and make the snot disappear. Second thing is, as he's getting closer, I'm going with my theology. I'm a pacifist, so I pass the fist. But in the midst of all those thoughts, this guy is on me. And he's hugging me. I have no idea what happened to the snot, and I don't want to know what happened to the snot. But he's hugging me, and he's weeping uncontrollably. And he goes, he goes, I'm so glad someone inv inv invited me to church, and the preacher is black, and I don't even like black people. But I heard about Jesus. That's what I love about unbelievers is they're unfiltered, and it's just pure, and it's beautiful. And by the way, God works with honest, humble people. So he's hugging me and he's like, and you're black and I don't even like black people and, and Jesus and I want to follow him now. And so here's the backstory. His girlfriend who became his fiance had spent five years in prison because of drug addiction and, and, and all types of things. Anyway, she came to Transformation Church. Somebody invited her and on an Easter, she came to faith. She got baptized. Then she was telling her boyfriend about Transformation Church. And he's like, I'm not going to no church with no black preachers preaching. Anyway, she somehow got him to come. He comes and Jesus hits him with his grace and turns him from a racist into a gracist. Now, the power, of the, the power of the gospel, some time goes by and they go, you know what, I think it's important that we get married now that we're followers of Christ. So we take them through marital counseling and uh, his fiance says, uh, Pastor Derwin, um, my father at 17 told me he never wanted to talk to me again and I have no one to walk me down the aisle. Would you walk me down the aisle? So she's wearing jeans and a white shirt with a little white thing on her head and her Bob wire tattoo around her right bicep. That's the kind of people we reach at Transformation Church. It's awesome. Okay, so <laughs> she asked me, black preacher, to walk white girl down the aisle and then the former, the former racist who's now a gracist is waiting for his bride with the black preacher he didn't want to meet, walking her down the aisle. He's crying, but this time it's not, it, it, it's not anger. It's, it's tears of joy of a broken heart of what God's grace does. He, he brings peace. And so I'm walking her down the aisle, you know, ease on down, ease on down. To, okay, so um, we get here, and then, you know, the preacher's supposed to say, who gives this woman away? But I was the preacher. So I had to come over here and go, who gives this woman away? And then uh, I do, and so. <laughs> that's what the gospel does. The gospel turns enemies into friends. 
The gospel turns stereotypes into stories of grace. We need the gospel and Jesus' people need to be the peacemakers because the Prince of Peace lives and dwells in them. Never in my 44 years of, uh, of living have I seen ethnic or racial tensions as high as they are. Now, I'm, I'm in the southeast of the United States of America, and the tensions are, are high. But why did Jesus leave his church? For those of you who are not followers of Christ yet, the church is not the building. The church is the people that Jesus purchased, that he redeemed with with his blood, that he gave his life for. That's the church, and he's left us here. He's left the church here to be a tutor to the world, to teach the world this is what humanity at its best look like. This is what it looks like to love, where enemies become friends, where the other and the different become one. The birth of Jesus, this cute little story that we have was was not so cute in the birth of Christ. Um, The first century second temple, Greco-Roman world that Jesus was born into, was ruled by a brutal dictator named Nero. Nero. 85% of the Roman world was slave. There was indentured slavery, different from American slavery, nonetheless still pretty bad. There was classism. There was incredible racism. Uh, Many Jewish people of the day, not all, would not have had meaningful relationships with the Gonim or the Gentiles because the Gentiles were known as pagan idolaters. By the way, just saying that word makes me just feel like a scholar, pagan idolater. Teenagers, try that on your parents. I learned about pagan idolater and look like this when you do it. They'll be like, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. But it was incredible, incredibly fractured and broken and divisive. But it was in the midst of this brokenness that the peace of heaven broke into earth. That Jesus, the Messiah, came to not just bring peace between God and man, but man between man. The early church, the early ecclesia, was comprised of Jews and Gentiles. A Jewish person is someone who was born ethnically Jew. A Gentile is everybody else. Not everybody, everybody else. That's how we say it in the South, everybody. And like I said, there was this incredible, incredible strife. And so the multi-ethnic church, which Transformation Church is an incredibly diverse church. It's a, it's a multi-ethnic church. The multi-ethnic church is not a 21st century phenomenon, but it's the first century norm. A good friend of mine named Brian Loritz quoted that. I thought it was pretty hot, so I just hijacked it. <laughs> but Jesus left the church a community of people to show the world what love looks like. As a matter of fact, in Antioch, which is in Syria now, where we have all of this chaos and brokenness, something happened beautiful 2,000 years ago. In Antioch, in Syria, these community of Jesus followers popped up into being, and they were comprised of Jews and Gentiles, and the Greco-Roman world and the Jewish people were like, what do we call them? What? Enemies become friends, they're marrying each other and and they're loving each other and they do this weird thing where they break bread and say it's the Messiah's body and they drink blood and they're one now and what do we call these people? So guess what they called them? Christians. It's in Acts chapter 11, moving to chapter 13, that the word Christian came because of these ethnically diverse communities called the church coming together. They had no other word to describe them other than those are Christians. That's where that word comes from. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 18, that's what we're going to read. And if you're new to the faith, uh, 18 years ago, I wouldn't have had no clue what Ephesians was. I would think it was a skin irritation, so... (laughs) You know, get some hydrocortisone, rub it on it. 
Uh, don't feel bad if you don't know. It was written by this gentleman by the name of Saul of Tarsus, who we know as the Apostle Paul. He grew up um, and, and, and he was immersed in the world of Pharisaical Judaism, which is about 7,000 men who were in charge of keeping Israel pure to the law of Moses. And he met Jesus on a road, by the way, called Damascus. And that word Damascus means sack full of blood. And when he meets, when he meets Jesus, he begins to go around the Greco-Roman world talking about how the blood of Jesus creates this new humanity. That wordplay is actually incredibly beautiful. So Ephesians chapter two, this is in about AD 58, so it's towards the end of his ministry or so, and he's writing to house churches in Ephesus, modern day Turkey. And so you've got these house churches with Jewish people and Gentile people, and so you've got incredible diversity, and this may shock you, sometimes people don't get along I'm getting my doctorate to teach you that, right? And so they were not getting along. They had their different baggages. And so Paul is writing to them about the miracle of grace and what grace creates. So let's read through the text. It reads this way. For by grace, you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Verse 11, therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at one time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Verse 14, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility, abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new people in place of two, so making peace and, and, make, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing hostility. Verse 17, and he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. This Christmas, Jesus wants to transform you and I into peacemakers. So how does Jesus do that? How does he transform you and I into peacemakers? And I wanna to talk to those of you around the world, the various campuses, um, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, he wants to invite you into participating in making a difference in the world. He doesn't just want to send you to heaven when you die. He wants to make you a portrait of heaven on earth while you live to give life to the others who need life. He's inviting you into a big, massive, beautiful story. So how does Jesus transform you into a peacemaker? Number one, by receiving Jesus' gift of grace. By receiving Jesus' gift of grace. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says this, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God. Not as a result of work so that no one may boast. Let me pause here. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, please listen. If you're a follower of Jesus, please listen. Followers of Jesus, don't ever get over the moment that you receive the greatest gift of all, Jesus. Don't ever get over for God so love the world that he gave his one and only son of whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. No matter how many books I write, no matter how many letters I get after my name, the greatest and most profound spiritual truth I know is this. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, for we are weak and he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Don't ever get over the fact that the God of the universe is head over heels in love with you, that he's never thought a moment without ever thinking about rescuing you through the gift of grace. He loves you. 
He likes you. And not only that, the gift of grace is that you and I become a dwelling place for the very God of the universe. Theologians call that regeneration. I call it grace. God himself comes to inhabit us. And you know what else he does? He forgives us. I don't know about you, but I need some things I need to be forgiven for. I ain't always been Pastor Derwin. I'm so thankful that for you young ones, you may not remember this if you're in your 20s or you're a teenager, there used to be this thing called whiteout. <laughs> and you'd write something and you'd get this little bottle and you'd dip it in there and you put white over it and it's crusty and it blots out what you wrote. Well, that was the purpose of rewriting something. Well, Jesus doesn't use whiteout. He uses blood out. And his com forgiveness is so complete that our history is rewritten. Our story is rewritten. And we go, Jesus, do you remember when I did this? He goes, no, I blooded it out. He forgives us and gives us a new life, and it is a gift of grace. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, and you're thinking, well, what can I do? I'll try harder, I'll try more. No, 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 God's salvation is so expensive, only one person in the universe has sufficient funds in his bank account to pay for it. His name is Jesus. And he goes, I got this. Will you receive the gift? That's the vertical beam of the cross. Now, it wouldn't be a cross if it was just a pole straight up, right? That wouldn't be a cross. That'd just be a beam. But then the horizontal beam of the cross is going to come in place. You have the vertical beam that reconciles us. We become friends of God, enemies to friends, orphans to adopt it. But then the horizontal beam means that same grace and love that connected us to God now connects us to enemies, and they become brothers and sisters. It makes a cross. Uh, we need more cross-eyed people. Check this out in verse 10. For we, are God, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good words, uh, good works. That word, workmanship, is the word ponium. It, it means God's artwork, um, God's display. So when Jesus vertically connects us to God by grace, that same grace connects us to one another to the different. And it becomes his artwork work. Um, I'm not an artist. I don't have those kind of skills. Uh, my stick figures aren't very good. And I probably wouldn't go to an art gallery unless, unless my wife was like, you want to go to an art gallery? Well, not really, but if you want to go, I'll go. And I suspect that I would look at these pictures and go, wow, that's, that's beautiful. Well, when God's grace connects us vertically and we connect with one another horizontally and cre create these multi-ethnic, multi-class communities, unbelievers go, wow, that's beautiful. Wow, I, I, I never knew that's what it was supposed to be. So that's what this means, that we are God's workmanship created in, good, in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So, let's continue. Number two, how does Jesus transform you into a peacemaker? By partnering with God and fulfilling his dream for humanity, which is peace. You and I get an opportunity to partner with God in fulfilling his dream for humanity, which is peace. Let's look at Ephesians 2, 11 through 13. Paul continues to write, he says, don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. So now if you're not ethnically Jewish, then you're a Gentile. This is discussing us that we were outsiders who needed to be brought into God's covenant family. It says, you were uncircumcised heathens by the Jews. Time out. If you're like 18, 19, 20 teenager, this is like a spiritual cuss word. For a Jewish person to call a Gentile, an uncircumcised heathen is like really, really bad. You're probably like, what's all a circumcision about? For the Jewish men, circumcision was a sign of the covenant that they belonged to God. And if you don't know what circumcision means, ask your daddy and I'm moving on. <laughs> I just thank the Lord for baptism now. 
I mean, seriously, like, I mean, as a Gentile and you're like 25 and, and you know, you're talking and I'm like, wait, wait, can we talk about it? Wait, wait, do we have to, pres-? I'm just saying. Okay, verse 12. Uh, let me finish. It says, uh, who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. Verse 12. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. This is speaking of the Gentiles. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promise God made to them. So what's the covenant promise? In Genesis chapter 12, God calls this man named Abram and changes his name to Abraham, which means father of many. God is like, yo, Abe, that's Hebrew. (laughs) Yo, Abe, listen, look at the stars. I'm going to make your descendants as great as the stars. You're going to be a father of many. And so through Abraham, the nation of Israel comes and ultimately the Jewish Messiah who becomes the blessing who creates a new family. Please hear me. God the Father wants his family back. He wants a family. God is longing for a family. And thousands of years ago through Abraham, he says, I'm enacting my plan to bring my family back. God wants a family and his family has different hair texture. Some have better tans than others. God wants his family. It goes on to say, you lived in this world without God and without hope, but you do know that there are big butts in the Bible, right? And God has big butts and he does not lie. But that is, who, where are you at? Who's that over here? Oh my gosh, that's you right there? I didn't know it was that funny. I wasn't trying to. (laughs) But now, listen to this. You have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you are far away from God, in the Bible, in particular the New Testament, when you see those who are far away from God, if you correspond that to the Old Testament, that's always talking about the Gentiles. But once you were far away from God, but now you've been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. Now let's skedaddle over to Galatians chapter three, verses eight and nine to hit home the good works and how the good work is this multi-ethnic church. What's more, scriptures look forward to this time when God would declare the Gentiles to be righteous because of their faith. God proclaimed this gospel, this good news to Abraham long ago when he said, all nations will be blessed through you. Did you catch that? That a part of the gospel, that Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and ascension to the right hand of the Father and the sending of the Spirit only makes sense in light of all nations will be blessed. That word nations is ethnos, where we get ethnic groups from. That's why I don't use the word race There's only one race, the human race, comprised of different ethnic groups. Then it says in verse 9, So all who put their faith in Christ share the same blessing Abraham received because of his faith. This Christmas, would you partner with God in fulfilling his dream for humanity, which is peace? Long before Dr. King preached his sermon, I have a dream In all eternity, the king of kings said, I have a dream, and I want a family. And it's going to be a diverse and beautiful family. Not a colorblind family, but a color-blessed family. Our ethnicities and backgrounds are a blessing, and when Jesus redeems them, we come together. We don't assimilate, we accommodate, and in our diversity, there is beauty. Not too far from where I'm at in the Charlotte, North Carolina area, several months ago, there was a great travesty at Mother Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina. A deranged young man filled with evil in his heart went into a Bible study and murdered innocent people. When he came to Charlotte, he was actually not too far away from where my family and I live. He was caught on video withdrawing money from an ATM. 
Nadine Collier, the daughter of Ethel Lance, one of the victims in the Mother Emanuel Amy Church massacre, said these words to the killer. You took something very precious from me. I will never talk to her again, but, here's a big but, but I forgive you and have mercy on your soul. I hope I never ever have to say those words in that context, but I do pray that I would exhibit that type of Christianity. That's big boy, big girl Christianity. That's Christian extremism which says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You see, it's not bombs and bullets that change the world, it's love, hope, grace, and mercy. If bombs and bullets changed the world, then Jesus would certainly have used them on the cross. But he gave his life, and out of his death came a new life and a new hope and a new way to be human. How do we become peacemakers through the transforming grace of Jesus? Number three, by believing that Jesus, through the cross, unified different ethnicities. By believing that Jesus, through the cross, unified different ethnicities. Look at verses 14 and 15a. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. The Jewish Messiah himself has brought peace to us. What did he do? He united Jews and Gentiles into one people. How did he do it? When on And in his own body on the cross, he broke down a dividing wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the the system of law with his commandments and regulations. Do you see the power of Jesus' body on the cross? It broke down the dividing walls. What's the Apostle Paul talking about? In the second temple Jewish context in Jerusalem, there were several portions of the context Uh, are several portions of the temple. The outer court is where the Gentiles would hang out. Then there was a court for women, a court for observant Jews, and then there was the holies of holies for the priests. And if a Gentile made it past a certain point into the holies of holies, there was a sign that says, enter at your own risk. If you're a Gentile and you pass this, you die. The Bible says that Jesus on the cross broke down the dividing walls. He broke them down. I don't have to break them down. Jesus broke them down. But we're pretty good in America at rebuilding what Jesus broke down, aren't we? We do it through preferences. Um, I haven't read in the Bible where it says, pick up your preferences and follow me but it does say pick up your cross and follow me. And in that culture, a cross was like pick up an electric chair and follow me. Pick up a lethal injection and follow me. That the vision and purposes of God are greater than our purposes. And when we get connected and aligned into his purposes, that's when our faith explodes and grows like never before before. Uh, My wife and I and a team of people planted Transformation Church, Super Bowl Sunday, February 7, 2010. People are like, that is a great marketing strategy. Football player, you plant on Super Bowl, that's awesome. And we were like, no, it snowed on the weekend we were supposed to plant. We're not that smart. (laughs) But I tell you what, though, it was so discouraging people going, that'll never work. There's a reason why Sunday's the most segregated time of the year, uh, of, of the week. It was so discouraging. Churches like that don't grow. You gotta reach people who look alike, think alike, dress alike, act alike, same social economic class. Don't talk about all that other stuff. Let's just get them into heaven. It was discouraging, but God delivered. Was it difficult and challenging to be a peacemaker? Yeah. I promise you, you will not grow if you are comfortable. If you have a personal trainer that comes to you and says, hey, today, you're gonna work out and you're gonna be so comfortable, 
I'm t- you're not gonna hurt at all. It's gonna be really, really comfortable. If that's, a- fire them immediately. Be like, no. In order to make it to the NFL, from high school and college and even to the pros, the amount of discomfort and difficulty was immense, but I grew and done something that was a childhood dream. Well, guess what? When you and I pick up our crosses and put down our preferences and join God in his agenda, it is uncomfortable, it is difficult, but God delivers and you will never, ever be the same. Now, We can't stop there though. Out of the overflow of that life, the unbelieving world goes, maybe I will check out Jesus. Maybe I will because that's supernatural what's happening. Maybe I will look into the claims of Christ. My wife and I didn't grow up as Christians. We were heathens. We'd be up in the club dropping it like it's hot. And you know what was interesting is the club was diverse. White people, black people, Asian people, Latino people. Then we went to church and we were like, there's more harmony in the club than it is in Jesus' club. And God was like, well, do something about it. How do we become peacemakers? Number four, by believing that Jesus through the cross brought peace between different ethnicities. By believing that Jesus through the cross brought peace. Let's look at Ephesians 2, 15b again. It says, he, that's Jesus, made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. That Jesus says, I have brought peace, and you and I just need to walk in that peace courageously. So Mother Emmanuel, African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, was one of the first AME churches. How did the African Methodist Episcopal Church start? In 1787, a Methodist man that happened to be black and a group of other blacks were in the Methodist church, but there were dividing walls of where white people could be and where black people could be. And the black people said, when we read the Bible, we don't see any dividing walls, so we're gonna come on down to the front and pray with our white brothers and sisters. Well, that didn't go too well. Richard Allen was down praying, hands clasped, and the elders of the church picked him up and threw him outside. And so him and the other black people said, we're gonna start the African Methodist Church. Episcopal Church. If you look at the history of black denominations in the United States, they were started because of racism and discrimination. Jesus brought peace. Jesus broke down the dividing walls. May we be a generation that tear down dividing walls and be peacemakers for the sake of the gospel, through the power of the gospel, and for the sake of lost people who go, Yeah, Jesus really loves everybody. You know what this is going to require? Something that I call incarnational living. So Christmas time, Jesus, the eternal son of God, incarnates. That's a Latin word for put on flesh. Uh, Jesus came in our situation. He was among us. He could identify with us. So it's important that we become incarnational Listeners. In other words, it means this. I want to hear your story because you matter. That does not happen on Facebook. Now, I expect people who don't know Jesus to be visceral and mean and nasty, but for Christians who know the gospel? So, so check this, this out. Grace makes me unoffendable. What can you do to me if Jesus has done something to me? Uh, y'all, y'all missed that one? <laughs> I'm unoffendable because of God's grace. What can you do to me if everything that he said is true? So you know what that means? Is I can listen and then I don't have to be aggressive or angry or mean. I've got the gospel. I'm saved. I'm a beloved child of God. I'm the very righteousness of God. So therefore, I can listen to you and hear your story. Until we listen to other people's stories, we will continuously make stereotypes. Grace obliterates stereotypes. 
It's important that we hear the story of another. Don't ever use this word. Well, you know those people. Have you sat down with those people? You might like those people and realize you got more in common with those people and might learn from those people. Incarnational listening is so important. And you know what happens when you listen to someone else's story? They know you love them. Treat everybody like Jesus really did die for them. We should be the greatest lover of people on earth because we've been loved the greatest. How do we become peacemakers? Appreciate the amen, brother. Appreciate it. <laughs> Had one amen. I appreciate it. If you, hey, if you want to say amen, you can because I'm black. You know, I don't mind. Y'all can talk to me. In the African-American tradition, it's called call and respond. You know, if you want to go, wow, that's cool. There you go. You know, it, it, so, so our church is about 55% white, 45% black, Asian, Latino, and you just got all types of stratosphere. And I'll see uh, uh, like white people in the congregation going, can I clap? Is it okay? Yeah. And the black people be like, yes, yes. <laughs> How do we become... Peacemakers. How does Jesus transform us into peacemakers this Christmas? Number five, by believing that Jesus through the cross created a new multi-ethnic ethnicity called the church. Church is not a building. Church is a people. Let's look at Ephesians 2.15b. This is so important. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. That word New is the word kainos. It means something that did not exist before. So look at how powerful the cross of Jesus is, the power of Jesus Christ. He's so powerful that when you say I do to him, you are fundamentally a new creation. And not only a new creation, you get a whole new family that you become one with. So watch this. My skin color does not determine my primary identity. The color of Jesus' blood does. Now, there you go. There you, you're getting it. You're getting it. Now, here's the hard part, though. Here's the hard part. When conflict happens, do we remember the blood? When conflict happens, that's when we grow, when we go, you know what? My identity is not in being black, white, Asian, or Latino, rich, middle class, or poor. My identity is that I'm a blood-bought child of Jesus, so therefore I can love and keep on loving and keep on loving because I've been eternally loved. We need to be color blind, uh, color blessed and not color blind. Like God gave me an epic tan. My wife is a white girl from Montana. We go to the beach, and she cooks herself like rotisserie chicken in the sun. <laughs> you know what I do? And you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. I get a white towel and put it on me. <laughs> on my upper body, lower body, and I got a big umbrella. I'm good. I look at my Caucasian brothers and sisters like, a rotisserie chicken. It's amazing. <laughs> All right, so... All right, so I'm hungry. I, I have to feed the machine. No, I'm just kidding. So um, the church in America is nearly 90% homogeneous. Now, some of that's because of demographics, but most of the time it's not. It's we want to be with people who are like us, who think like us, act like us. But the problem with that is you don't grow, and it doesn't display the unity of John 17. So typically, we want to make a church full of just onions. Now, I like onions. I'll eat an onion like an apple. I just can't kiss my wife afterwards. So kissing my wife is more important than the pleasure of onions. So, amen. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> so that was good, preacher. That was good. She was like, honey, did you hear what he just said? But sometimes... I mean, just eating the onions by themselves is, I mean, but this is the way a lot of our churches are. But then sometimes we're just a church full of croutons. 
or we're, you know, just a church full of cheese or no comment here. You know, we got here. I don't have any jalapenos. Um, but you know what God wants to do? God's like, you know what I'm going to do? I want to make a salad bowl church because all of these items separated aren't as good when they're together. Well, okay, and so you want to put some lettuce because you need some roughage, you know what I'm saying? Something foundational up in there, you know? And then, and then you got to get some, you need some tomatoes, you know? I, I, God made them, so they must be worth something. Throw those in there. You got to get some onions, right? I mean, onions just are, just add flavor, you know, some kick to it. You need some people in your church to get some kick to it, right? Like, I don't even know what this is right here. California, I don't know. I'm just put that in there. And then you need, you need, you need, some, you need some cheese. And of course, you got to have some black olives up in there. You know what I mean? Keep everybody on rhythm when you clap. You know what I'm saying? Um... Some of y'all need some help. But then, but then, you need some croutons, but in the words of Nacho Libre, got to get it on there. But, but, one missing ingredient, salad dressing. Hot sauce, yeah. And this is like the grace of God, which binds and mixes us Together, and then God says, Do life together, mix it up, make a good, nutritious salad. Need a salad bowl church. Just get all next to each other, just <laughs> loving on each other, you know what I'm saying? And then you go to the world and go, Have some, taste and see that the Lord is good. Number six, how does Jesus transform us into a peacemaker this Christmas? By believing that Jesus, through the cross, killed hostility between ethnicities, making one new multi-ethnic body. Verse 16 says this, together as one body, if you're not yet a follower of Christ, one of the metaphors of Jesus' church is a body. Friends, and I love the way you take notes here. I wish Transformation Church would do it. Can everybody just catch me right here in the eyes? Jesus right now is at the right hand of his Father, praying for us, interceding for us, and the Holy Spirit comes to live in us, so his presence is in us as well. But how does Jesus move on planet Earth today if he's right next to his daddy in the realm called heaven. It's through his body, you and I. Notice these words, together as one body. Now, I'm a former football player and there will be teammates that I'll know from high school. Like my high school in San Antonio, Texas, won today and I'm fired up. You know why? Because the coaches at that school and my teammates changed my life. I had no way out of the situation I was in, but those coaches showed me a better way. Brotherhood. Brotherhood. Like, when you begin to see that we're one body, there's, there's a newness of love, there's a newness of passion that we move from consuming Jesus to participating in what Jesus wants to do. It says, together... With one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God. How did he do it? By means of his death on the cross. The cross is powerful. We need more cross-eyed people. The word reconciliation, it means that a divorced couple are remarried. It means that enemies become friends. That is the heartbeat of the gospel. That God says, I want my family and I'm sending my son so that I can have more sons and daughters and they're black and they're white and they're green. They got mullets. Whatever they may be, they are mine and I love them and they're covered by my blood. That's a picture of heaven. That's what our world needs. 
Now, notice how he finishes. And our hostility toward each other was put to death. So you know what that means? Is that I can walk in the good works that God prepared beforehand in love, not in defense, not afraid of awkward conversations, not afraid of difficulties. No, I can walk in what Christ has already done, that my intentions towards you are grace-filled from the beginning because of what Christ has begun in our hearts. This Christmas, God wants to make you a peacemaker. Um, I'm going to read just real quickly from my book, The High Definition Leader. And I preach basically one page from the book. But uh, the letter will explain. It's pretty self-explanatory. It says, Dear Pastor Dewey. So people who know me from San Antonio, everybody calls me Dewey. That's like family. When I got to the NFL, then everybody started calling me Derwin, and it stuck. Um, so Dewey. She says, I have actively attended and worshiped at traditional churches in America for about 50 years. And I'm often asked why I now attend a non-denominational, multi-ethnic, multi-generational one that has loud contemporary music. <laughs> Usually I answer because people are coming to Jesus and getting baptized all the time and lives are transformed. Matthew 16, 18 tells us, that the rock, which is his son, is the foundation of the church and that it is the only answer to a thriving, successful church. Christ must be lifted up to draw all men unto himself and a high and lofty view of God is of utmost importance. I find this to be evident in all areas of transformation. Church is a pleasure to worship here and it helps me to focus. Because the church has been segregated for many years, I appreciate the call to intentional worship across racial and cultural lines. I know that when Jesus calls us to become like him, he means in all ways. And sometimes we don't even know what it is until we are informed and inspired by others. Each step we make, we become more like him, is a blessing to us. This is a little white woman in her 70s, and she's proud to call me her pastor. One, one, one last confession, I think this is important. Uh, I'm from San Antonio, and I had never lived in the South, and so I had these preconceived ideas of what the South was gonna be like. Like, I thought when I got off the plane to sign with the Panthers that the Ku Klux Klan would be on horses and stuff, and I was like, it's not like that. But deep in my psyche was this bigotry towards Southern white people who spoke with a country accent I immediately stereotyped them. And I didn't even know it. And you know what God did to heal me? He gave me a church full of them. <laughs> and it's awesome. It's wonderful. They love me and I love them and I've confessed. I said, I didn't even know. I didn't even know. And it's beautiful to have this relationship Friends, in the southeast of the United States of America, a thiving, beautiful, multi-ethnic church. And there are these old white women who hold my hand and they go, I'm thankful that you're my pastor. That is the gospel. <laughs> Forgiveness and new life and our world, our country needs it. That's why Jesus has left us. Christmas is a hostile invasion of love. Amen. Thank you. Let's pray. Yeah. Will y'all pray with me? Father, thank you for my Saddleback family all around the world. Thank you for the people of Transformation Church courageous enough to believe this crazy idea about a gospel-centered multi-ethnic church. This Christmas, may we be people of peace. And I pray right now for those among us who are saying, you know what, Pastor Derwin, um, I, I caught a lot of what you said, but I want to know Jesus. I want to know about this gift. I, I want to receive this gift. I want to receive this forgiveness. I want a new life. I want to know love. I want to know hope. I want Jesus. If, if that's you and you're ready to bow your knee to him, in the silence of your heart, say this to him. In this moment, Lord Jesus, I bow my knee to you and confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that you died for my sins and that you rose again to give me new life. I receive this gift. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Hi, I'm Jay Cranda, the online pastor here at Saddleback Church. We're so glad you joined us to watch this message today. At Saddleback, we believe that life is better together. That's why we want you to get connected to our church family, whether in person or online. We have campuses all over Southern California and on four continents all around the world that would love to welcome you to their weekend services. You can find a campus near you at saddleback.com slash locations. And if you're not able to attend a campus in person, don't worry. We have an online community designed just for you. You'll have an opportunity to connect with the messages each week and find resources to help you grow your faith. Thanks again for watching, and we look forward to welcoming you into our church family.